Let's say you're an alien trying to understand how a car works, but you only have pictures of a car. Sure, you can make many guesses of how the car's gears will turn or how the wheel will move, but you'll never get the full picture unless you test out the car in person and take it apart. To play around with each gear and each mechanism in order to understand how and why it works. This is the same challenge biologists have faced for a long time when it comes to the little molecules that make life, life. Molecules such as the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. Understanding how this protein works and how it interacts with the drugs that we have is highly important, especially during the pandemic and now when we have to come up with measures to prevent the disease from becoming a problem again. The problem is, the atomic details are far too small for visible light, so you can't point a video camera at it and record how the atoms will move around. We're left with static 3D pictures of the proteins that, well, while impressive, only give us small clues as to how it works. So today, we're going to learn about molecular dynamic simulations, and with it, we're going to turn static pictures of the spike protein into movies and uncover the hidden mechanisms of how this molecule works. And now understanding all of this can potentially contribute to preventing another pandemic. But what the heck is a protein? Protein is made up of smaller molecules called amino acids, linked together via chemical bonds. The sequence of these amino acids is what determines the shape of these proteins, and the shape determines its behavior, its nature. But you might be wondering, what's so special about each flavor of the amino acids? But what are these chemical bonds? What are atoms even? And what compels them to move in a very specific way? More fundamentally, what makes anything in the world move in the first place? The answer to that can be found in physics, specifically Newton's laws of motion. What the laws state are pretty simple. Objects change their velocity only if forces act upon them. That the total force's influence is equal to mass times acceleration. If an object applies a force on another object, it must also feel the opposing force. This is the bedrock of molecular dynamics. But to use Newton's laws, you need forces. If Newton's laws are the bread of how motion works, then the electric force is the butter of everything in the molecular world. In the molecular world, there are four major players. The electrostatic force between the ions, the van der Waals forces, created from attractions and repulsions within charges, and the Pauli repulsion, the bonds between each atom created from the overlap of electron probabilities, and when bonds are made, some atoms just like electrons more than other atoms, generating electrical poles similar to magnets. The simulation takes all of these forces and Newton's laws to calculate the motion of all of the atoms. The position of an atom determines what other atoms it will interact with, hence the forces between them. We then let the acceleration, initial position, and velocity determine the next position of the atom. That will determine the forces, accelerations, and velocities of the next step. And then we rinse and repeat. These two steps are very close together in time. All of this is known as the Verlet algorithm. Those mathematically inclined amongst you will find that there are almost no ways around algorithms like these for systems with three or more atoms. This is known as the three-body problem, and they actually wrote a book on it. Note that all of the forces here, except for the electrostatic force, are approximated from quantum mechanics. This means that certain phenomena are excluded from this type of simulation, such as breaking chemical bonds. You can use QMMM if you really want to do that. There are, of course, more types of forces, but we're only covering the four major ones. Forces aren't the only thing that can determine how our molecular machines work. The environment we simulate our proteins in has to also be realistic. Before we run molecular dynamics, we have to put the protein through some preparation steps. We put the protein in a box, 
aqua water and ions to simulate the electrically neutral watery environment of the cell. Our box, however, is a very small space, meaning that it will not accurately simulate a living cell properly. So we can artificially expand the box by adding portals on the sides of the box. Just like the game Portals, if one particle enters the portal, it will arrive out on the other side as if the two locations were spatially connected. Then we energetically relax the system. The unloaded stringy bonds inside our system can yank the whole structure in a very unrealistic way. Then we can bring the protein up to temperature and pressure, and we're ready. If you want to try learning more about molecular dynamics on your own, you'd realize that there are many deep and complicated details from various disciplines. Starting from strong basics is very important. Luckily, the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.org, has a unique and powerful way to help you get started on that. Brilliant is where you can learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. The interactives on Brilliant help you build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not just memorization, which will help you own the knowledge you've obtained. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also become a better thinker. Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data. As we're about to see, a lot of molecular dynamics involves in finding pattern and insights within a sea of data. These courses are perfect for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis. With a fully built out suite of new content from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regressions. You'll also learn how to parse and visualize massive data sets to make them easier to interpret. Beyond that, you'll also gain real world insight by working with real data sets from sources such as Starbucks, X, Spotify, and more. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash nanorooms or click on the link in the description below. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So what insights can we gain from all of this? Well, first, let's rewind to the point before we started simulating. Simulations are just like any other experiment. You need to be clear about what you're interested in, design all the controls, and replicate the experiment many times. We're only interested in the part of the spike protein that recognizes our keyhole. It's called the receptor binding domain, and it recognizes the ACE2 receptor. Most of the drugs that we have, which are also proteins, simply bind to the key and prevent it from unlocking the keyhole. This looks good on paper, but viruses scramble their keys via mutations extremely often making our drugs prone to becoming obsolete. Although, there is another type of drug. It binds the side of the key instead of the actual key itself, malforming the key. But why in the world does it work? Is there some sort of secret button in there in the protein? How do the gears and pulleys in the key protein react that way? And that, my friends, is what molecular dynamics can answer. So, we'll make two versions of the simulation one with the drug and one without as the control, repeating each one three times. As your science teacher has probably said in school, three replicates ensure that the results we get in one simulation aren't just one-off flukes. And therein lies the power of molecular dynamics. You have access to all of the atom's positions at any given time, so you can use powerful statistical tools to study them. This plays out much like a detective game. We'll look at the data for clues and piece all those clues together to pin down a culprit. Our data must be amazing for us to be able to do that. A lot of the times though, it's not. The protein structure doesn't stabilize in the first few nanoseconds of the simulation. This can make the analysis faulty. A pretty good measure for this stability is the root mean squared distance. Looking at the RMSD graph, you can see that it stabilizes roughly in the last 30 nanoseconds of the simulation. So we'll only analyze the data within that time frame. On a more detailed level, we can also compare how often each amino acid shakes. It might give us more clues about what the drug actually does. Looking at the results, the amino acids in the left shoulder region shake less often while the right flank region shakes much more often. This left shoulder is very important since it's a part of the key. That's our first clue as to what the drug actually does. 
the motion of the left shoulder is restricted by the drug. But why does that happen? Our drug binds on the right shoulder of the protein. How can it affect the left side and the right flank? And here's a pretty clever solution. The most likely culprit of this strange action at a distance is the molecular forces acting together in a very specific yet tangled network. Let's uncover this network. I'm going to put all the amino acids in a table and tick down every time it sees another amino acid within a small radius. The idea is that within this small radius, the amino acids will interact with one another in a significant way. This is known as an adjacency matrix. That means if we perturb this amino acid here, the signal will get sent to these other amino acids surrounding it. The signal doesn't have to stop there, since these surrounding amino acids also affect other amino acids around them, including the origin of the signal itself. But after each layer that the signal goes through, the signal should also get weaker. So for every layer that the signal is sent through, we will roughly model this effect by dividing the signal strengths by factorials. Effectively, this new matrix we've created represents the net signal after signal transmissions have settled down. We call it the communicability matrix. Let's now group all of the residues that are on the same helices and loops together to see the bigger picture. If we perturb the right side, which happens to be where the drug binds, the signal will propagate through the neck. Once the neck is perturbed, the left side will react in turn. This is how the right shoulder is connected to the left shoulder. This is further supported by subtracting the communicability matrix of the drug bound version from the control. The drug disrupted the interactions between the right shoulder and the neck, which strengthens the interactions between the neck and the left shoulder. This is why the left shoulder became less flexible. We found the answer. Or did we? This hypothesis is only supported by one piece of evidence. Remember, one piece of evidence is not enough to convict a culprit, usually. But wait, there's more evidence. We can try to classify the motions of a binding domain with and without the drug using a method called PCA. There are great resources out there that explain this in detail, linked in the description by the way, but here's a rundown of what it actually does for our purposes. Putting the movement data together, the PCA auto classifies the essential modes of motion, and the four most important ones are shown here. In particular, the difference between modes 3 and 4 in the two versions tells us that, indeed, the binding causes the key to flop around less and that the shoulders of the binding domain become more closed. The final nail in the coffin for our culprit would be the videos of our simulation. As you can see, it does cause a smaller gap. And voila, we have our final conclusion. The signal is sent from the right shoulder to the left. The binding of the drug disrupts the signal relay, causing the left shoulder to become stiffer and more closed off, preventing it from binding to the ACE2 receptor. Beyond this conclusion, you've also discovered the tangled networks behind the motion of the receptor binding domain. You now essentially have the control manuals for it. Imagine the future possibilities for bioengineering them. And I feel like this is the true spirit of molecular dynamics. It's a tool that allows people to do all of this from the convenience of a computer screen, which in addition to wet lab experiments can greatly expand our understanding of the beautiful molecules of life. Thank you for watching. Special thanks to Dr. James and his team for providing me with the data. Please go give them and other molecular dynamics resources a read. And while you're at it, please go support me on Patreon to see an in-depth behind-the-scenes videos and sneak peeks for upcoming videos. See you soon.